Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's conversation with Paul Ehrlich. This unique opportunity to help celebrate the publication of Paul's new memoir, Life, The Journey Through Science and Politics, and to get his perspective on some of the important science and political issues of 2023. Before addressing the main topic, I want to start with acknowledging the indigenous people on whose ancestral land we're meeting today. This is Stanford's official land acknowledgement. We recognize that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. For today's conversation, I'm thrilled to be joined by my friend and mentor, Paul Ehrlich. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. The Woods Institute has been for nearly 20 years Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. We're excited to be a founding pillar in the new Stanford Door School of Sustainability, officially launched on September 1st of last year. Today's session is part, but, but I think the best part, of our ongoing series of conversations with discoverers, thought leaders, and change makers. Paul is all of these things and more. He's one of the founders of the discipline of modern population biology, linking taxonomy, evolution, behavior, and ecology, and global change into a coherent framework for understanding nature and helping us with the past out of the mess we're in. His discoveries about the dynamics of populations within a species and in creating the new discipline of coevolution are magnificent achievements recognized with nearly every major environmental prize, including, among many others, the Blue Planet Prize, the Tyler Prize, and the Crawford Prize, many received jointly with his brilliant partner and collaborator, Anne. Along with Anne, Paul has transformed the landscape of science communication, authoring 50 books on topics ranging from butterfly identification to prospects for a sustainable future. Probably best known for his 1968 book, The Population Bomb, Paul has been for more than 50 years the leading clarion about the foolishness of abusing our planetary support system. For an entire generation, Paul has been the iconic public scientist. From many appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson to public bets about sustainability indicators. Whether the topic is national politics or Stanford operation, Paul always has a deep, often biting or ironic thought. I don't necessarily agree with everyone, but I always respect the wisdom, integrity, and wit at its core. Paul's new memoir is funny and insightful, stroll through the events of Paul's life, the factors that shaped his thinking, and where we are now. I look forward to unfolding several of these themes over the next hour. The format for today's conversation is that I'll start with a few questions. After about 30 minutes, we'll get to the good part, questions from all of you in the audience. If you want to ask a question, please enter it through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, Paul, Paul, I want to start out with a striking statement in your book that the two things at Stanford that you're proudest of are saving Jasper Ridge and creating the human biology program. And I wonder if you could spin those out a little bit for us. Well. Uh, Saving Jasper Ridge was purely selfish, as you know, because <clears throat> I was starting my research career on a certain group of butterflies that happened to live up there. And uh, over time, it became clear that it was going to be a long-term study, but the university was anxious to turn it into a housing development. And this led to uh, politics, not at the national level, but politics at the local level around here with a colleague, Dick Holm, who has now gone, but was my chief mentor in those days. And we battled with the university and finally got it put aside. And uh, the reason I think it's the most important thing probably that I ever did at Stanford University, maybe ever did in the world, is Stanford is a leading 
fine university. Uh, one of the things I love about Stanford is that I can have colleagues, like say to say at random, Chris Field, who knows more about climate than I'll ever even imagine. And so one of the great advantages of being at Stanford is the diversity of other people interested in what sorts of things I'm interested in, but not knowing exactly what I know. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in a department with 50 butterfly specialists, but I want to be in a department with some plant people because it turns out the butterflies wisely eat the plants. Anyway, Jasper Ridge, as far as I know, is the best on-campus research facility in North America, at least, and maybe in the world, in the sense that it's in an interesting area that's undergoing great change, but right next door, right literally on the same land, is a world-class research university with a bunch of world-class researchers. And uh, there's nothing like it otherwise on Stanford. You could grow mushrooms in the linear accelerator. The linear accelerator is going to do nothing about the fate of the world. It's going to going to help us understand a little bit more about the universe, but it's not going to help us understand what we've got to understand now. So, yes, Jasper Ridge is the most important facility Stanford has. And, and I should say that, that Jasper Ridge was the core of 30 years of my own research program, and I owe a personal debt <laughs> to that effort you undertook with Dick Holm to preserve it back in the early stages of your time at Stanford. Well, also, uh, you probably remember a colleague who has run Jasper Ridge as a scientist, both working very much in global change, uh, but also keeping the various projects from stepping on each other. So if you should ever meet that scientist, give her my regards. Well, I appreciate you pointing out the role that, that my partner, uh, Nona, has made in the success of the Jasper Ridge venture. Uh, I also very much appreciate her contributions there. Tell me a little more about human biology. Human biology was in many ways the first real commitment to an interdisciplinary major almost in any U.S. university. It was, again, not entirely planning. Um, I'm having a senior moment now, uh, but the guy at the Ford Foundation who came to us in, it must have been around 1970, I don't remember all the dates. Um, he and I had known each other because we were both very interested in the Second World War. And we were friends, and he came and he said, uh, we'd like to give Stanford some money to do research on these new environmental issues. And we'd like to start a whole program to give money for research on environmental issues. And I said to him, uh, no, that's not what you want to do, because there are not enough scientists around to spend the money sensibly. What you should do is give money to training programs uh, that will get, build up a core of people who actually understand the environment and then can do research. And that's where the human biology program started. Um, it was also, he also knew Dave. Uh, Hampton? Hampton, I think, right? No. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, never mind. Never mind. Anyway, uh, we, we struggled to get people to help us apply for the money from the Ford Foundation. Uh, and then we got it. And as soon as the money appeared, then suddenly uh, people came out of the woodwork to spend it. But we did manage. Don Kennedy was, played a big role in that, who was later president of Stanford and head of the Food and Drug Administration. And um, uh, he got involved, and we actually designed a program uh, to have a social science route and a biological, bio, uh, biophysical route and train people in looking at the world as a whole, trying to get rid of my main goal at Stanford for years, where I've, one of my many failures, was to get rid of the Aristotelian approach to the world and stop having ridiculous departments with ridiculous subjects where none of the problems can be solved. Uh, and that was the goal of the human biology program. And it's certainly been successful from the point of view of recruiting students. Uh, and it certainly was copied in many, many places. Uh, so I'm proud of that. 
The other thing I think I mentioned, as long as we're talking pride and not bragging. Uh, Please. The, the, you know, the, I had what turned out to be a smart idea because Fred Terman, who was provost in those days, and by the way, in those days, very interested in the issue of how you support education. Where does funding come from and so on? And he and the president at the time, Wally Sterling, were trying to turn Stanford into a university from a finishing school and working very hard at it. And he took me and said, I want you to go to the library. My engineering students say it's a wonderful library, but I'd like you to go find out. So I went and found out. And it was actually a lousy library. They did have engineering books, but they didn't have critical books in all kinds of other areas, including areas I was interested in. So then his revenge was to put me on the library committee. And the issue was, I'm going to make the numbers up, but Stanford had, say, 4 million volumes and was buying 100,000 a year. Texas had 14 million volumes and was buying 2 million a year. And Harvard was even beyond that. And everybody we talked to, the only solution to Stanford's lousy library was to put more money into buying more books. And in those days, Stanford was not rich. And one day, I came up, I, I have two library stories. All right. I, sorry. I look forward one, to <laughs> one is that I said, why don't we take $30,000 out of the book buying budget buy a car and a salary, and have the car drive back and forth to Berkeley every day continuously so that we would have interlibrary loan not on a two-week basis, but on a two-hour basis. And we basically doubled or more the size of Stanford's library for a lot less than it would have cost to buy the books. And the Gutenberg, address, uh, Gutenberg Express, they called it, lasted a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the only other thing I want to say about the library is they were complaining about the salaries for the women who took the books coming in and uh, registered them according to the Dewey Decimal System. They had to code them. And uh, I asked them what they were doing, and they said one of the problems is that the departments don't like the Dewey Decimal System, so they often ask for it to be changed. And I said, changed. And he said, well, how the hell do you find mm -hmm. the books yet? And he said, well, we have this book of the Dewey Decimal System. As they brought, I, we asked them to bring it in. It's the size of an unabridged dictionary, and it has streamers of flimsy coming out of oh, it, no. where the political science department wants Nazis to be under GOP <laughs> instead of MDSP, and so on. And so we looked at it, and I said, get rid of it. We are now going to close all our stacks and the books come in already cataloged in the Library of Congress, Congress system. system. And so we saved a lot of space, All we right. saved a lot of money. Uh, it was a different place back then. Sorry, I didn't Well, I love the it. story about the Ford Foundation coming and saying they want to give money because I think that would be a striking and unexpected experience for most of today's faculty. <laughs> yes. let, let me follow up a little bit on the the Earth Systems Experience, because I think this idea of having ambitiously interdisciplinary programs has continued to be important for the university and the sustainability space, Earth Systems, which started, I think, in the early, well, 90s, around 1990, uh, was one example. And then, of course, the Woods Institute was based on the idea of building interdisciplinary scholarship. And, and the new school of sustainability is also based on the idea that we need to break down departmental silos to do things right. But you're skeptical about our ability to do that as long as we keep the departments. Uh, I'm skeptical about putting together a school put together by whoever designed it, knowing nothing whatsoever about the topic. In other words, I call it the fake school of sustainability for the most obvious reason, which you can teach a middle schooler very easily, if you're going to have sustainability, you have to ask what you're going to sustain. And the entire school has nothing of demography. And what has to be sustained, of course, is a human population of a certain size 
and a level of consumption of a certain size. If you're not discussing population and, and consumption, you're not discussing sustainability. And uh, it's actually, I brought a note because I looked at the website. I don't know if you can see this well enough to read it. Um, the social, if you're going to have a sustainability school, it's going to have to be primarily in the social sciences and biology. Not in engineering, because engineers just want to plane the world fat, flat and build electric cars to drive over it. And not in earth sciences, because what they want to do is go get more petroleum to destroy <coughs> the climate, which they're doing a good job of, by the way. That is a success. Yeah, hard to disagree uh, with that. Uh, and it says, the social science division will discover the causes of sustainability challenges. Let me tell you, the two people sitting here know the causes of virtually all the sustainability challenges. Uh, I'm, anyway, so what we need to do, let me be brief. One of the things that I've learned, and I think Chris has learned as well, is that just telling people what the science says does not change their behavior. And that is a major thing if you're going to be sustainable. And so one of the big challenges if you want to have a sustainability field is to look very hard to get the right social scientists who will come in and try and inform us how the hell to do it. And the arts play a big role. If you, if for example, on sustainability, one single picture has done more for sustainability on this planet than likely the door school will do in its entire existence. And that's the picture the of blue Earth, marble. Earth taken from space. Uh, we need art. We need narrative. It's not that we don't need the science, but we have to do the art and narrative around valid science, which is what Chris creates. Tell, tell us more about the MOB, the Millennium Assessment of Human Behavior, and, and how you see that being a force to move the needle on recognizing the importance of these human dimensions it's, for solving sustainability. It's a sustainability. successful failure. <clears throat> Anne and I, back in uh, around the turn of the century, there was a very large ecosystem assessment done by, I think it was about 2,000 scientists, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. um, getting the state of our life support systems, basically, and what they told us was something that we knew and lots of people already knew, that things were in bad shape and it had to be changed. And what Ann and I suggested was we now need a millennium assessment of human behavior. Why in hell, when the climate scientists have done a brilliant job of working out details in a very complex system, we may not be perfect, but I think there is the closest thing the scientific consensus you can ever have that adding greenhouse gases and cutting down forests is not the way to have a livable climate in the future. And that we are actually, one of the things that doesn't get enough PR from my point of view is how close we are to the wet bulb temperature limits on actually how much you're gonna be able to be outside. <coughs> on survivability. Work. And we're, we're, our lives are getting to be more and more dependent on air conditioning for Christ's sake. So uh, the, <laughs> I was, I was raving about something. So we were on mob, <laughs> and you were going to oh, say yeah. how mob is. And so we said we, we need a millennium assessment of human behavior to get people involved in understanding what the really big existential challenges are and get civil society, which is already very active on lots of issues, to work in a coordinated way on the really big issues. That are, I mean, uh, the... Uh, one of the things that's been a concern of mine for my entire life is equity issues. Uh, I've worked very hard with some economists on, uh, on those issues, how we treat people that are thought of as being in different races or different genders or whatever uh, are huge, huge issues, and they need to be brought into any sustainability thing big time once you understand that you have to know the demography. And for instance, if, if anybody said to me, anybody says to me, say to me, what's the first thing we ought to do to start towards population shrinkage? Paul, what's the first thing we ought to do to move toward population shrinkage? The one thing that we could do 
is give women full rights and opportunities around the world. Misogyny is a huge problem uh, for everybody, and we, we have done, we have a little bit of progress uh, here at Stanford. For example, when I joined the department, there was not a single woman in it. Now I would say the strength of the ecology evolution group is very strongly now in women. And uh, we need to take advantage of not just women, but people in various minorities. And uh, we're not doing anywhere near enough or taking the kinds of chances and risks that we should be taking to do it. Uh, Let's talk a little more about population. I need a gin for the... There you go. Okay. You, you drink, I'll talk. So I totally agree that the empowerment of women is the, the most effective tool we've seen for decreasing population, decreasing overall fertility. And, and there's been remarkable progress yeah. in that in many countries around the world. But uh, last year in November, we had the uh, notable and really depressing passing 8 billion people alive on the planet now. And do you see the next steps with population to just continue to strive for um, increasing economic opportunities and increasing empowerment? And people are increasingly talking now about the uh, unfavorable consequences of too rapid population decline, especially in rich countries where fertility rates have dropped way below two. Uh, or what else should we be doing, and how should we think about the really remarkable progress in uh, declining birth rates that we've seen over the last decades? Uh, <clears throat> From my point of view, uh, we should be very much cheered, not just by the declining birth rates where they're occurring, but where they're occurring, because they're occurring in the rich countries, which are the big time consumers. Unfortunately, when I originally got interested in the uh, population issue, uh, too many people thought it was a problem of too many poor people. Uh, and actually, John Holder and I in 1951 actually produced the little equation that tells you that's not the case that rich people are, right. too many rich people is the worst problem than too many poor people. I, I wrote that on the blackboard, on the whiteboard for my freshman class this morning. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, uh, so uh, I, I can say something cheery in the sense that uh, finally, I think what can be almost the last word on this for people was developed by an economist who you know, Partha Dasgupta, who did a gigantic study for the British government, a 600-page booklet now. And what he did was he looked at what, uh, one of the many things he did is he looked at what a sustainable population might be. And he came to the conclusion that if everyone were willing to live at a Mexican standard of living, which is less than half of our income, uh, that is, if the rich countries would be willing to change their behavior and give the poor countries a chance that are not at the Mexican standard of living yet to come up, we might support, I believe his number was 3.2 billion people. Well, we're now through past eight. That solves the problem of what we should be doing because maybe Parth is wrong. Maybe we could support 4 billion or maybe we could only support 2 billion, but the direction is clear and we have yet to start going that direction as a global world. Some countries are moving in that direction. Uh, but I, I just came to mind, of course, China, the, the countries that controlled their populations in East Asia are now the rich countries in East Asia. Uh, but one of the, uh, let me just put in to make sure we get to it, the worst problem in our education system and the worst problem for everybody listening to this is the escalating chances of a full-scale nuclear war going on right now. And we're sitting here with a full-scale land war going on in Europe. And unlike most listeners and even you, I remember the Second World War. And the fact that it's going on now 
is dramatically increasing the chances possibly of a purposeful nuclear war, but we've already had a whole series of near misses and we're increasing the chances of an accidental full-scale nuclear war, which for the mob, Stanford, everybody else, it's all over if we have a full-scale nuclear war. How did I get on that? Well, I just insist on well, always saying know, something I, I, about that. It, and it, it is interesting that if I think of the arc of your career that risks of nuclear war and disarmament really was the overwhelmingly important issue of the 50s and 60s. And, and, um, and I, I think that we have tended to inappropriately sort of push it back to the back of mind. And uh, certainly this tragic war in Ukraine brings back the prospect. If you, if you go back, if you look at the little paper that's posted on normal, I think it's important for people to think at least part time on the big history of human beings. We were originally, and for most of our history, a small group animal, something like 20 to 50 to 100 people. And now we're trying, that was both genetic and cultural, and now we're trying to live in gigantic groups, and we haven't really sat down to think about the changes. And the, the two other papers that I put in, one is one by somebody else, Bill Steffen, talking about the great acceleration. Most people don't realize how extremely different the world is today from what it was in, 20, uh, in 1954. The, the, we're the, for the first time in our history, we have developed weapons that can end civilization. Lots of civilizations disappeared in the past, but the first time now we have a global civilization looking. And that's something we should all be thinking about. And yet in these recently released papers, it turns out the U.S. is still planning to fight both Russia and China. Uh, we are, there was on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago, a show on the U.S. Navy that could have been programmed by Mahan, who was the, um, the equivalent of Clausewitz for the sea, who, you know, uh, uh, geopolitics in the water. And they were actually talking about building more aircraft carriers. You know, the Chinese have diagrams of aircraft carriers in their desert. They fly their $5 million missiles in and sink them all the time. And we're thinking about building something that will have 6,000 American boys and girls on board that can be sunk by a $5 million missile, even though they cost, I don't know how many trillion dollars yeah. now. It yeah. is just insane. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, actually, let, let me, um, let me uh, turn the conversation slightly to what it means to be a public scientist, because you have always been comfortable being outspoken about where you are on politics, on science, on population, on everything. And, and many of my colleagues struggle with the question of, is my credibility as an objective scholar put at risk by expressing strong opinions about a diversity of issues? And say a few things about the way you think about this this balance between being well, a citizen. I am a born loudmouth. That was my mother's oh, okay. fault. Okay, well, I, I, can, I no, can agree with it, that. Interestingly enough, um, that was encouraged at Stanford. You know, I, I never got any flack. I, I went on TV and called Richard Nixon a crook. Never heard a thing from the administration. My colleagues were all supportive. When we wrote The Population Bomb, Don Kennedy read it, Peter Raven read it. One of the things Anne and I have always done is had our equivalent of peer review, having a bunch of people read it so we're not speaking just for ourselves. But uh, Steve Schneider, who was one of the great climatologists at Stanford, uh, and I talked a lot about this, and we came to the conclusion that A, uh, it was incumbent on scientists to give their opinions. You don't give up your rights to being a citizen because you're a scientist. That if you're giving opinions in science, you should first of all give what the scientific consensus is. Then, if you differ from the consensus, say why. And then, uh, feel free to give your opinions. For instance, people, I've often gotten the comment, 
how dare you say something about climate? You're a butterfly scientist. And I always say, you know, some of my closest friends are some of the best climate scientists in the world. I read the literature. I spend a huge amount of time studying it in one form or another. Uh, and why should that then forbid me from giving my opinion? Uh, and I think one of the nice things, also largely based at Stanford, not entirely, was a program that was started called the Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellows. And one of the great leaders at Stanford, Pam Matson, was central to that. And the whole idea was to train mid-range scientists to talk to the media and so on. In fact, I was lecturing a bunch of mid-range scientists on how to give ambush interviews. You know, when, when you're approached by the press you don't, or by the TV, you don't give materials and methods first. You give the message. And I was doing that the day on 9-11 in Washington, D.C. Wow. Also, a shout out to Jane Lubchenco and Hal Mooney, oh, yeah. who oh, were also yeah. no, no, critical I, in starting the Aldo yeah. Leopold Leadership Program. Um, no, but I, Pam is a person who has tried to do integrated stuff. Bring, she was, for instance, she started the sustainability thing in the National Academy, if I recall. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and also, you know, has not been that a real Jane icon. And Hal, on the other side, have not been fully. And, 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 and I, I, I think that the. Those three, Jane Lubchenco, Hal Mooney, and Pam Matson, really have been um, just iconic uh, leaders in sustainability science, and, and Pam especially in moving forward sustainability at Stanford. Can I say one more thing? Absolutely. People have said to me, how can you be a biologist uh, and a scientist like this and then turn yourself to studies of the jaw, human jaw and dentistry? I got brought into that. All, I love that book, by the way. All, well, all, we wrote a book called Jaws. All three of my closest research colleagues are Mexicans at the moment. One of them is an uh, uh, um, oral scientist. And the pleasure that I get out of that is that we've found things that can help people a lot directly today. You and I struggle to change the tra trajectory of climate, but we don't know any one person who is being helped by our, that work. It may be millions of people yeah. in the future yeah. if we're lucky, but the nice thing about working on the oral problems was that wrong things are being done to a lot of people and you could actually change their lives and that's a, a different kind of pleasure. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, that, that brings me to the, to the thought that I wanted to close with. And, and when I read your book, the, the thing that comes through most clearly is the the strength that you've gotten from the love of your family and and the relationships with colleagues and 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 you, know, you speak and and I uh, totally support your interpretation that being really fortunate in choosing a partner is probably the most <laughs> critical part of that but but just as, as other people think about their lives what what do you have any advice for I'm a social uh, animal <laughs> And I think your friends, and when I say friends, I include the relatives that are friends. Most of us have relatives that aren't friends. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's, in my view, there's basically nothing else. You, helping other people, and particularly the people that you're close to. Again, you're a small group animal. Uh, I think I've had a lasting relationship with about 200 people. I've known maybe 1,000, but the last, and that's what turns out for most people. Mm -hmm. Their Christmas lists and so on, it's 100 to 200 people. Value them, help them, and enjoy them. It's just wonderful. I'm going to turn now to questions from the audience. I can see that there are a bunch um, that are lined up here. And um, I'm going to start with um, one from, from Mike Connor. It says, I became an ecologist after the introductory course you co-taught with Peter Raven. It was like watching the interaction between stand-up comics like the Smothers Brothers. I think the back and forth between you taught me as a student that there are different ways to think about the same facts. I later was lucky enough to do the Jasper Ridge course with Hal and later Hopkins Marine Station with Chuck Baxter. The opportunity to do a quarter-long research project was the most 
valuable for a student experience. Um, and then he goes on to say, and how did co-teaching with Peter Raven change your perspectives? Well, uh, you shouldn't put that in the past. I had six emails from Peter today. Uh, he's one of my best sources of jokes. We talk on the phone, I don't know, uh, at least once every three weeks or so. Uh, Peter's still going strong, and he's reviewing, right now, reviewing a book chapter for one of my Mexican friends, two of my Mexican friends and me. Uh, so uh, one of the great things about being at Stanford and being a scientist is unlike going into business and moving around, you build a community of scientists around the world uh, that uh, you can enjoy wine, dinners, jokes, and so on with. And uh, these days, you really need a good sense of humor. I mean. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but I did blither. Well, I, I, I very much respect and appreciate the experience that this person brings from you know, wonderful must people. have been must have been 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, and Peter so, and I have had a disagreement recently on a paper. Yeah, as you should. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a here's a question from Maya Zhu. As a pioneer of the concept of coevolution, how do you think we can try to prevent the impacts of uh, extinction and conserve our biodiversity in the future? Uh, the main thing that we have to do, clearly in my mind, to preserve biodiversity is to reduce the scale of the human enterprise. In other words, as long as you're going to keep growing, uh, and I don't, I'm bo both in population and in, uh, uh, in consumption, then biodiversity is going to continue to disappear until we start paying even higher prices for it. Uh, now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do other things uh, and try. And my colleague, Gerardo Ceballos, who uh, I've done a lot of work on extinction with, has preserved huge chunks of Mexico by being a very clever politician. But if the Mexican population continues to grow, if the situation in Central and South America gets even worse and there's an even bigger flow of people, uh, they're going to use the resources, and they're going to eat the biodiversity. It's that simple. And uh, so you always got to keep looking at the big picture. Uh, you, the biodiversity, the wild animals that we once knew have been replaced now uh, by domestic animals. The, most of the mammals in the world in weight are human beings and they're domesticates, and they're a setup for disease. So that uh, we haven't talked about the epidemiological environment, but it's tragically awful. And in the Trump administration, the little bit that had been done in the Obama administration to give us a warning system for pandemics uh, was dis discarded. Uh, and we don't in the United States have a public health system worth talking about. And people are dying of that all the time in one way or another. And it was interesting when Sandra Kahn and I were working on the JAWS book, we couldn't find any data, for example, on how many kids have braces, even hmm. though the braces wow. are mostly wasted. But yeah. if, you don't, if it's not heart disease, if you don't go to the Framingham study, there's no public health system that preserves hmm. uh, wow, information. And also, or another thing, uh, we now know that um, disrupted sleep not only is bad for your brain, but it's bad for many of your organ systems and reduces your life expectancy. A main reason for disrupted sleep is mouth breathing. Many of you have heard of CPAP machines that try and help with that, but we're assaulted with a brand new array of immune, immune active things into your nose. Yeah. For instance, uh, rare earths, which weren't a factor in our Systems, never mind it before. But yeah. now they're mined and then they're trashed in computers and TV screens. And then there's all the compounds we've invented that are out there. And there are nasty signs, for instance, of decrease, decreasing sperm counts in, in human males. Well, that's one way to control the population. You, you know, yeah. a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. <clears throat> uh, I don't think we want to go back to those days. Yeah. Uh, so. 
I don't know why I'm raving about it, but well, it's... Yeah. Let, yeah. Let me follow up on the extinction question. I, I, as I said this morning in my class, I, I put up the impact equals population times affluence times technology equation that you and John Holdren made famous. And, and a student came up to me after the end and said, it's really hard to see how we solve this problem without decreasing affluence. Are you really saying that we need to be poorer in the future? And yeah. how would you have answered that? I, well, uh, first of all, I'd say, uh, although I have differed with many economists, not Larry Goulder here, but some economists like Partha know what's going on, uh, but some economists have actually studied happiness. And the results tend to be uniform. Once your basic needs are, you've got shelter, food, and so on, happiness goes up while you're getting those, and then it doesn't. And one of the things that um, we need to discuss much more as a society is what makes people happy, what are human beings for. The financialization of value leads to ridiculous results. In other words, some, you know, there's a moron who thinks we can occupy the entire universe because he has 10 children and billions of dollars. Billions of dollars doesn't disguise the fact that he's a moron. And we have to get a much more ethical discussion about things like empathy. How do we get people to put themselves in the shoes of other people who are not as well off? And I don't think we want people to be poor. Uh, if you, lots of people live at the Mexican standard of living and are very happy. And I think a lot of us would be a lot happier, for example, if we didn't find 750 emails every morning uh, trying to sell you this, that, or the other thing, and so on. But it, we have to ask the question, what kind of life do we want? Then we have to ask the question, how many people can have that kind of life? My view is, if we were, in those terms, poorer, we could support billions of people way into the future. The idea doesn't have to be cram as many people onto the planet in the next 30 years as we can and let the whole system collapse. And um, I don't have any single example on that, except I know a lot of people who live a simpler life than I do, uh, and my, most of my pleasure has not come from cell phones or computers. So that would be a good question for a real school of sustainability. Yes, exactly. Can and well, we need much more ethical discussion. Yeah. The whole question of empathy, most people don't talk about it. It's not in the newspapers. It's not in the TV. Uh, is it, what are we doing at the southern border? Is that ethical? Another question, are borders ethical? You know, the resources were distributed sort of at random. You know, the old line about why is our oil under their sand? I mean, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a perfect example. Let me go back to the um, questions online. Here's one from someone whose name isn't listed. With current, with current climate and planetary health projections, do you think it's responsible, fair, for the relatively affluent to choose to have children today? Let's put it this way. I would not deny anyone the chance to have children. The issue is not whether we should have any children, but how many we children we should each have, and how that, that's not something that's a personal decision. If you have 10 children, you're an evil person trying to basically destroy the world. That doesn't mean the children are evil. Once you have the children, you should do everything you can to take care of them and give them decent lives. Uh, but the issue is how many children you have and how, what kind of life you can give those children. Uh, and I, am, I have to say I'm appalled at the war on women in this country now. Uh, having said what we said about women before, uh, we're going, that's the one area where we're going most rapidly backwards. And uh, we've got to discuss that much more and the issue of how many children you should have, I would, my own recommendation is now stop at one. At some point, uh, you can go beyond that. At some point we may decide 
discover something miraculous when we're down around 2 billion people and say, well, we could actually keep going at a steady level with 2.5 billion? So go to two, three children uh, off and on for a while. But anything today more than two that isn't a multiple birth uh, is not reasonable. And two billion is about the number of people the Earth had when you were born, right? Now, I was the two billionth person <laughs> okay. by pure coincidence, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Let's see, another question from the audience. Okay, this one, this is kind of long, but a really interesting question from Bob Tyson who was a BS in geology in 1969, MFA in photography in 84. Dr. Ehrlich, I absolutely agree with you how crucial art and myth building and narrative are and will be. Speaking as a student of Dick Johns, I also think you short shrift earth science. Have you followed the seismic shift in Stanford's departments away from extractive disciplines and wholesale into environment, sustainability, and restorative applications of geology and related disciplines. Oh, well, I'm not anti-geology at all. I'm, I'm not even anti-petroleum engineering. Uh, to a certain extent, we're going to continue to extract petroleum and doing it in the safest possible way. Uh, I, I don't like what a lot of it's used for, particularly plastics are a rising problem. But I, I guess I'd say I misspoke. It was that the, the main thrust of getting the money for the door school seemed to me to be coming from engineering and extractive geology. Uh, but can I say some of my best friends are? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can say that. Uh, I'm working with Tony Barnowski here. Tony and Liz Hadley are two of my colleagues in biology who not only agree with me on most of the political issues, but Tony has been wonderful at giving important data on the extinction crisis by calculating what the normal rates of extinction were between the mass extinction events. And he's a fantastic scientist who worked very hard at running Jasper Ridge for a time and so on. I'm definitely not anti-Earth science, uh, but I'm anti uh, people who think it's just fine that we now, when we had copper 100% on the surface when we started in the agricultural revolution, now feel it's perfectly okay to keep going down a mile to get copper that's one thousandth of one percent or yeah. something. That, that, but lots of earth scientists know that and publish good stuff on it, and they're not listened to just like you and, and I aren't and, listened to. Well, that's a good point. But I, but I, I do want to agree with, with um, Bob that many of my Stanford colleagues in the earth sciences are among the most personally dedicated advocates of um, sustainability and of transitioning the earth sciences away from yep. extraction toward being part of the solution. I agree. If possible. Here's a question that um, we've talked about a little bit. Dave Gardner asked, is there anything significant you would do differently if in your life you had a do-over? Uh, <laughs> you don't well, have to answer, but it's, it's fun First of all, about. obviously, uh, as you can see in the, if you read the book, uh, there are things that I did when we wrote The Population Bomb that I no longer, that I'd give different emphasis uh, to. Uh, but what people ask me, you know, how can you possibly say this quoting something from 50 years ago, any scientist who's working in an area where they believe 50 years later exactly what they said 50 years before is in a pretty dull area of science. Yeah. So, uh, so that is one of the, th one of the things. Actually, uh, I shouldn't say this, but I will. I had an opportunity that I gave up when I was an undergraduate major at Penn in zoology I had about 200 other zoology majors, almost every one of them, I think maybe every one was male, and everyone except me was a uh, pre-med. And 
Uh, I spent my undergraduate years doing wise things like drinking and chasing women. And at that stage, uh, I was applying to go to the University of Kansas to work with Charles Michener as a graduate student. And uh, everybody else was sweating out getting into medical school. And I was hoping to get into Kansas. And my courtesy uncle, Ben Haskell, called me up. And he was at Jefferson Medical. He was a big deal there. And he said, Paul, uh, you know, if you'd like to go to medical school, we'd be pleased to have you at Jeff Med. That's the way the world works, you know, <laughs> not credit, just connections. And I said, no, thank you, Uncle Ben. Uh, I want to go to Kansas. And he said, that's fine. I think that was a huge mistake. He was the chair of proctology. And I thought some training in proctology, if I knew Trump and his hemorrhoids were going to be in the Congress, you know, having some training in proctology would be really useful. So it was a major mistake. A good point. And I got to say, my, the story in the book about how um, you were pushed into the decision to not include Anne as an author on the population bomb, I, I really respected that. It's, I was naive. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's a question from Diana Zagara. What are your opinions on the electric energy boom, the renewable energy boom? Many solar farms are starting to pop up all over the place. Um, there are obviously impacts from collecting of battery materials and um, now a question of worker exploitation. Do you think that we're overdoing the push to renewables? No. Uh, I think there are risks to the push to renewables. This is, again, <clears throat> depends on what level you look at it. I mean, for example, Robert Sapolsky and I agree that we don't know yet whether the agricultural revolution was a smart thing for Homo <laughs> sapiens. Good point. But we're not going to be able to reverse <laughs> that. Yeah. Well, when you get up to the situation we're in now, there just aren't any easy solutions or any risk-free solutions. And certainly moving towards uh, better grids and more sustainable ways of generating electricity are clearly valuable today. Uh, what, I, what, what does turn me off, though, is the continual... F I turn on the television, okay? We have a society which does not allow you easily to deal with sex in conversation with children and so on and so forth. But when you turn on the television, everything is sold via text, and a major thing is automobiles. And via this, sex. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the way to go with automobiles is to start moving down to having fewer of them, having them owned collectively. Most of the cars just sit there most of the time. Uh, and we, uh, some of the moves like lift and so on are in the right direction. Bikes are in a better direction. We made a huge mistake with suburbanization, which we should be trying to reverse. So I'm totally in favor of pushing hard on renewables because they're necessary at the moment. But what appalls me is we're not talking about the more basic things of why we should be transferring. And I haven't looked at the data rate. You probably know it better than I do, but I think that the, er, the surge in renewables hasn't reduced the use of fossil fuels. The <laughs> fossil fuel use is still going up while the renewables go up. And until we get off that and say automobile, everybody running around with several tons of metal and plastics attached to them in an automobile has got to go. And the trend is that you got even bigger. We're back at the SUVs. It's yeah. nuts. Your, your comment that renewables are essential, but rethinking other aspects of the way we organize our societies and our living arrangements are also essential, and, uh, the, super important. The, the risks with the, renew the, with the grids in particular are, in my view, underrated. I mean, for instance, uh, John Holder and I got drunk one night and calculated how many Hiroshima-sized A-bombs uh, e were necessary to destroy the U.S. or the then Soviet Union as functional entities. We have thousands still. And mm -hmm. our numbers were, I think, 
about a dozen for the U.S. and about 10 for Russia. All you need to do is bring down the grid and hit the transportation centers and virtually everybody starves. In other words, and a solar storm could bring down the grid, which would not be great. Uh, and people don't understand these risks. And it's time to get a good stiff drink, I think, when you're there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of which, there, there, I saw a couple of questions that I did want to swing back to that maybe help us close this out. So um, uh, it, here's a note from Kevin Hester. It says, Paul, you and I were supposed to have dinner together in Sydney, but your expedition was canceled by the pandemic. Are we still going to do it? We should do it while you're still young. <laughs> My, Anne and I are part-time Australians. I went there to work many years ago with Charles Birch, who was the leading ecologist in the, one of the two leading ecologists in the world at the time, and we love Australia. Kevin, we have some hope of coming out that way in October, but I think probably not. Um, the, it, it turns out that Betty Davis was right. Old age is not for sissies, but we'll see. It's a long flight. Still, yeah. We still, unfortunately, our friends over there are dying off. So we got to get out there in some ways. Yeah. Well, uh, Paul, this has been uh, truly a fabulous conversation. I can't say it's been uplifting uh, at every <laughs> point, but it's been, but it's been really insightful. And, and I, I especially appreciate the, um, the way you can combine uh, irony and objective thinking to really point us at the things we need to be doing and the things that we so rarely are. So thank you again. I also want to thank everybody for joining us online. Really, it's been a fabulous conversation. Thank you, Anne, for sharing Paul today. And I want to thank the uh, Superb Woods Institute staff who helped make this possible, especially Celia Price, Molly Field, Chris Black, and Justin Warren for the technology. Thanks, everybody. I want to thank you, Chris. One of the great values of being at Stanford is having you as a colleague. Well, and you. And source of knowledge. Thank you so much. So long, everyone.